a professor of clinical psychology at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and also the, and, uh, together with my colleague Pim Kuipers, a co-director of the WHO Collaborating Center in our uh, university. Um, I will look a little bit more into uh, mental health symptoms of, of refugees and migrants, because that's uh, my specialty, or people in humanitarian uh, settings affected by humanitarian crisis. Um, and I will also uh, talk about evidence-based mental health intervention or psychosocial interventions. What's, what do we have available for crisis-affected uh, populations? The situation in Ukraine, of course, is, uh, is, is a horrific war um, currently uh, in Ukraine uh, related to direct uh, war-related traumatic events, people under da daily threat, having the bombs uh, explode in their, uh, well, close to them, having to take shelter uh, in the here in the metro station or in the train station, a lack of shelter, a lack of food in some cities that are uh, under, under siege, people having to take uh, at the moment uh, risky steps to go uh, away from where they are, from their shelter, leaving their family behind, leaving their husbands uh, behind uh, because they have to stay. Uh, and of course, always when going uh, to another country uh, on a flight, people are uh, can be also exposed to other traumatic events uh, when they are uh, doing that. And that may not be the case so much uh, with Ukrainian refugees, although we actually at the moment still don't know, it's a very chaotic situation, but that has definitely happened to many other refugees, such as Syrian refugees or Afghani refugees, who had to do uh, take, take very risky steps to go to, to European countries or countries bordering the country where they came from. Once they are, people are in, in, in a safe place, uh, they are often faced with a lot of uh, daily, diff uh, daily living difficulties, daily, daily situations such as being having to stay for a long time in overcrowded uh, reception facilities, being isolated from uh, their own uh, network, from their own family. Uh, sometimes they're uh, encountering, or very often they're encountering the fact that they it's difficult to get an employment, uh, and that leads sometimes to a loss of role and also to failure of, of, of the expectations that people had when they were actually uh, uh, migrating to, to a safer place. And also in the Netherlands, but I hope that that's not the case now for Ukrainian refugees, at least the signs are there that it's not going to be like that. But sometimes people uh, that are resettled into an, uh, another country have to uh, wait a long time for them to have their residency permits being uh, given. Hopefully it's not the case for the Ukrainian refugees. Um, if we look at the mental disorders that people um, uh, may or may not develop, fortunately, of course, most people will not develop any mental disorder. Uh, we just did a meta-analysis on mental disorders in people that are um, uh, externally displaced uh, because of uh, war and crisis, uh, so refugees and migrants. Uh, we only included um, uh, studies in this meta-analysis on, on studies that were done with clinical interviews, so actual diagnosis of, of mental disorders, and we found that refugees and migrants are at an, well, at an, at an strongly increased risk for having a major depression. It's uh, approximately the prevalence, approximately 27%. Although it's very much, very heterogeneous across populations. So we had a large uh, variation between studies, uh, whereas it's only 4.4 in the general population, 4.4%. We see a prevalence of uh, almost 25%, uh, one in four people meeting criteria for PTSD. Uh, which is only 1% in the general population. Bipolar disorder is uh, uh, 10 times more prevalent in refugees and migrants. And also a psychotic disorder is four times uh, or almost four times more prevalent. And of course, all these uh, psychological symptoms um, are also uh, uh, mainly caused by ex being exposed to these uh, war-related uh, events trauma, but also um, socioeconomic difficulties once people are in their um, uh, in a safe place. Uh, and that leads to impaired functioning and of course also to related uh, somatic health conditions. So uh, what are ways actually to support people in need of psychosocial support? Uh, early after traumatic events. And I think Irina just did a wonderful job in presenting the results of her 
chatbot, which was um, developed so quickly in these uh, extreme circumstances. Um, we we uh, have in general uh, within the humanitarian field, uh, a lot of NGOs and humanitarian actors will uh, look at this pyramid that was developed by the Interagency Standing Committee, which is the UN body for um, humanitarian support. And this uh, pyramid shows that um, uh, the majority of people and of course the most important needs, first of all, are basic services and security. And I think that's uh, what also Irina just uh, explained that most people will first need to be safe in order uh, for psychosocial services to become uh, more important. Um, for, for psychosocial services, I think uh, the, one, the, the first level in the pyramid is that of community and family supports. That's where um, uh, people are thinking of offering psychosocial services to uh, people affected by crisis, by families, um, to villages. And uh, one of these uh, interventions that can be put in this uh, layer of supports could be psychological first aid. And that's where uh, the chatbot of Irina is also uh, um, partly based on. Uh, another uh, level of support is a little bit higher up. It's the focused person-to-person uh, -person, non-specialized supports. So that's when, for instance, um, uh, not necessarily psycholo psychologists or psychiatrists, but people trained by psychologists and psychiatrists. So for instance, um, uh, community health workers, nurses, uh, or a low intensity therapist, or for instance, even lay people could offer face to face uh, in person supports in groups or uh, individual uh, to people uh, with some levels of distress. And then uh, all the way up in the pyramid, there is the level of the specialized services. So for instance, treatments for people, uh, indicated prevention for PTSD or for depression. Um, Looking at psychological first aid, that is an intervention that was originally developed by the uh, National Center for PTSD and the Child Traumatic Stress Network in the US, but it has been adapted by the WHO um, uh, later on. Uh, and that is uh, actually available uh, all across the world. It's trained in humanitarian, humanitarian settings worldwide. Um, there's also a Ukrainian version available. It can just be downloaded from the WHO website. And it consists of mainly of practical care and support to address basic needs of people they have early after traumatic events, uh, mainly to protect them from further harm, but also to link them to uh, important information, other support services, and also their own support services in their network. Um, because it was an, uh, initially developed as an answer to the to the debrief the, the negative findings with debriefing, where there was some pressure on on sharing emotional experiences. Actually, um, psychological first aid also contains an advice not to focus too much on on pressuring people to talk about the event, but more on reducing distress and comforting people um, in the early phases after the traumatic event. Looking at the evidence for PFA, for uh, psychological first aid, it's delivered all across the world in many humanitarian settings, yet there is very limited evidence on its uh, effectiveness. Uh, we did it uh, um, together with colleagues from um, Queen Mary University in Edinburgh and also the ARC, uh, ARC International. We did a study uh, in uh, post-Ebola Sierra Leone where we trained um, uh, staff of uh, uh, public healthcare facilities in delivering PFA. Um, and we uh, actually only looked at the effects of the training. Uh, we were not funded to look at the effects on the people receiving PS PFA, but we found that only after a half a day of training uh, in PFA, actually up to six months after the training, these um, uh, staff members of the, uh, of the healthcare centers were much better able to, um, to, to know what types of, of, of support they, they should give to people. So we did a kind of a knowledge test. We also asked them open-ended questions on how would you respond, for instance, if a person would uh, come into an emergency room and you would have to provide mental health and psychosocial support. And then the people who received PFA had more appropriate answers than the people who did not receive a PFA. And we scored that. Um, uh, blindly by independent raiders, which is assuring, but of course it's not actually evidence for the effects on, on the people uh, who have received it. 
uh, last year, a, a study was published from the US, uh, a study in assault victims in the US uh, on uh, the effects of PFA. I think it's the first randomized controlled trial on PFA showing that there was no effect on mental health symptoms prevention, but uh, the people who received PFA had a faster recovery in terms of general functioning, uh, which is, I think, a very um, promising uh, type of, of uh, finding, also in the light of the negative effects that were found previously with debriefing. So it appears that PFA actually does have some benefits. Uh, another intervention that lasts uh, during the past five years, also in response to other refugee crises, has been developed by the WHO as a scalable intervention, also to offer in settings where, uh, where psychologists and psychiatrists are very uh, uh, scarce. So, for instance, in this case, this is Uganda, where it was offered to um, South Sudanese refugees, is the Self-Help Plus intervention. This is a five sessions a group stress management course, which was developed by WHO. And it's very, very low intensity. It can be offered to 30 groups of uh, up to 30 people. So these are quite big groups by uh, non-specialized facilitators who are trained in delivering uh, this intervention. But these, these um, uh, facilitators have also audio tapes with relaxation and mindfulness exercises uh, available, and also a, a very structured illustrated uh, book that's also to be shared with people receiving uh, self-help uh, plus. And it's based on acceptance and commitment therapy. So it mainly consists of uh, relaxation, mindfulness and uh, compassion. Uh, focused uh, exercises. Um, in the meantime, uh, the past years, uh, the WHO, together with uh, academic partners, did uh, three trials on the effects of, uh, of Self-Help Plus, and it uh, has been proven effective in the prevention of uh, mental disorders, um, most notably depression, in refugees uh, in Europe, so refugees with various backgrounds, for instance, Syrian, Afghani refugees, Iraqi refugees, also in Turkey, and also in reducing distress and improving well-being in uh, refugees in Uganda. So the evidence actually is quite promising for uh, self-help plus, also in terms of uh, other refugee crisis. Um, another intervention that is now uh, actually widely available also in Ukrainian language, it's also already uh, adapted in Ukraine by colleagues from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. This is a problem management plus it's uh, developed also by WHO it's a task sharing intervention so it's meant for uh, non professional helpers to be delivered under supervision of psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, in the Netherlands we're actually having it delivered to Syrian refugees by trained uh, peer refugees so trained Syrians. Therefore, it's very scalable uh, because, of course, uh, it's easy, it, it's it's cheaper, but also uh, more practical to train non-professionals than professionals because there are just more people available. Uh, we know from from studies already uh, carried out uh, that it's effective and it's also at, it's a transdiagnostic uh, treatment. So it's um, not only meant for PTSD only or for depression, but also meant to actually be delivered to people with one of these diagnoses or maybe a mixture of these diagnoses. It's short, it's uh, five sessions of uh, 90 minutes. We are now actually uh, trying to reduce it to 60 minutes. It's, uh, there's two versions of it, it's individual and a group version. Um, the group version is uh, offered to groups of six to eight people or eight to 10 people. And usually it's offered for people with increased distress uh, and reduced functioning. So people, for instance, scoring high on an instrument for distress, like the K10, and also on uh, showing reduced functioning, for instance, on the HUDES. Um, the WHO does uh, recommend always to do cultural adaptation for target populations. But as I just said, there is already a Ukrainian version available on the website of WHO. And currently, we're looking in the Netherlands to have a Ukrainian helpers being trained in, in delivering PM+. Plus. Um, PM Plus has several aims. It's aimed to provide participants and clients with skills to manage emotional problems related to depression, anxiety, and stress, as well as daily practical problems. It's not very much focused on traumatic events, uh, although if a, if a traumatic event is a daily problem, if a person has daily um, uh, um, intrusions, of course, 
there will also be a focus on, on dealing with these daily intrusions, but there is no element of exposure in PM+. It's actually meant to reduce problems that clients identify as being of most concern to them in their daily lives at that time. The content mainly is based on problem solving, on stress management, so relaxation exercises, on behavioral activation, so getting people active again uh, within the possibilities they have, of course, because that depends eh, if people are very limited, if they are not in a safe situation, that's not possible. Um, and accessing social support, so have, uh, helping people to access their, their own network again for, for social support. Um, sorry, individual PM plus has already been evaluated in, in two big trials, one in Pakistan, uh, in, uh, in uh, primary healthcare facilities, and also in Kenya, in uh, females who were affected by um, uh, gender based violence. And these two trials have shown very good effects on PM plus in, in terms of reducing depression, anxiety, but also PTSD. Uh, despite the fact that it does not contain any exposure. So that's actually quite, quite positive. These, these studies have been published. Uh, here you see also the references to the publications. Group PM plus is, uh, in, in, has also been studied and it has been shown to be effective in uh, Pakistan in an RCT and also in Nepal. And also in terms of the strengths project in Jordan. And I'll talk a bit about very shortly, uh, also uh, briefly about that later. Um, we evaluated PM Plus uh, in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, and here you see an, uh, a nice picture of our team in Rotterdam. Um, in Rotterdam, we trained Syrian refugees to deliver PM Plus to other Syrian refugees uh, uh, with increased levels of distress. Um, and we found at one week and three months after um, uh, the intervention, we found significant differences between the PM Plus group compared to the control group. It was a pilot randomized control trial. Uh, and we found very good effects in terms of reducing anxiety, depression, and PTSD, but also in reducing self-identified problems and improving uh, overall functioning. And of course, this is only a pilot RCT. So we're now um, doing a larger RCT and we uh, have already included this sample and we expect to have the final results ready in, uh, in May this year. Um, Within our project, we have an, a big project at the moment in, uh, is funded by Euro Horizon 2020, uh, European Union. It's a project in which we are evaluating this Syrian version for PM+, but we're also uh, using the group version of PM+. And we have already uh, finalized a study in Azraq refugee camp in Jordan. This study was carried out by the University of New South Wales, the group of Richard Bryant, in collaboration with uh, the International Medical Corps. Uh, and in this uh, refugee camp, um, 410 adult Syrian refugees uh, and their children were randomized into group PM plus or care as usual. Um, and in that uh, trial, um, uh, small effects were found. Um, they found significant reductions in depression and self-identified problems, but not uh, no reductions in anxiety, PTSD, grief, and uh, overall functioning and also not uh, effects on uh, the mental health of the children of the people who were actually uh, uh, receiving PM+. However, uh, after controlling for uh, traumatic events and uh, ongoing stressors, the impacts of PM+, on depression increased from uh, with an effect size of 0.40 to 0.90. So that implies that uh, this trial has been affected a lot by ongoing stressors. In the time we were doing this trial, uh, there was the COVID pandemic, so people were really confined to uh, staying in their tents uh, all the time. Uh, they had to socially distance. So this ongoing stressors probably also affected the whole trial and limited our um, uh, potential to detect differences between the arms. Um, finally, uh, in terms of, well, what is needed? Um, if we look at the guidelines that the ICS has just published in terms of uh, uh, prevention of PTSD, um, actually the strongest evidence at the moment is there for indicated prevention strategies. We have fortunately good interventions available to address PTSD symptoms, but of course also for depression and for other anxiety problems. 
And for PTSD, of course, we know that cognitive behavioral therapies, but also EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing is effective, are effective treatments for PTSD. So we have actually quite good evidence that stepped care or collaborative care strategies would there would be very uh, effective in terms of addressing people with mental health needs affected by uh, war and crisis and also people uh, who are now uh, entering countries such as the Netherlands, but also other European countries bordering Ukraine and potentially also in the Ukraine, uh, one situation is, is uh, more or less stable. Um, in conclusions, uh, in concluding, I can say that we have very good evidence for scalable interventions in war and crisis affected population that has also uh, partly be due to the Syrian refugee crisis, where a lot of studies have been funded on Syrian refugees. Interestingly, uh, these studies were mainly done in low income settings, and actually we are now able to implement these findings from these low income settings in high income settings, which is, of course, the opposite of what we have done many years uh, before. Um, it's always important to culturally adapt interventions to the target populations needed. In terms of the WHO interventions, they are already available in Ukrainian. But of course, if you want to implement an intervention, it's always important to think about cultural adaptation to a target population. Because we know now from studies, uh, meta-analysis on the topic, that um, cultural adaptation actually increases the effectiveness of interventions. It increases the uh, acceptability, feasibility, but also the effectiveness. And it doesn't mean that you have to delete uh, the, the, the effective components of the intervention, but it means that you would systematically adapt the language of the intervention to the cultural uh, concepts of how people talk about mental health symptoms. Further, it's very important also to stress that, of course, it's important to address Ukrainian refugees, but it's also important to, of course, keep on within our uh, countries hosting refugees, also other refugees, uh, also Syrian refugees, Afghani refugees, and also to offer multi-sectoral interventions, not only focusing on psychosocial support, psychological support, but also looking at other needs that people have, also in collaboration with actors that, that offer these types of interventions. We also have to be a little bit humble, I think. Um, we also always have to realize that psychosocial support is very important, but that should not actually uh, be delivered and, and other interventions should not be delivered. We should also think about, for instance, financial help, for instance, cash transfers to refugees, etc. because we also know that these interventions have important benefits for people's mental health. In terms of new research venues, um, I think it's very important and, and also in line with what Irina was, was presenting on, that we hardly have any knowledge about what helps people in acute distress, in acute trauma, in unsafe situations. Uh, we really need evidence uh, on that. And I think Irina's chatbot is a very good first step to actually gather this evidence. And I hope we can also look at that from a research perspective. Uh, would it be that we have to help people with sleeping problems, with getting uh, less stressed, um, under the circumstances they are in. Uh, but that's, I think it's, it's, it's very much of an uh, empirical question. And another thing is to look at digital innovations and how actually it can help people uh, with access to this innovation without forgetting that some people do not have access to, um, uh, to these uh, digital tools or have very low uh, technological uh, literacy. So anyway, thanks a lot for your uh, attention and. Uh, uh, of course, you can always contact me if you would like to have further information on the intervention I was talking about or on any other topic presented. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marit, for that really clear overview of where, where we are, where we are going, what to do, what is the evidence, what studies have been done. That is extremely helpful, I guess, for, for, for delivering that at this moment. If, if I may, I just also have a question that came up when I was uh, talking to Irina yesterday, and maybe Irina can feed me into this, but there's also some guidance and as what not to do, right? So new, what should we not do? And I learned from Irina, and you, you could speak to that, what the Ministry of Health has sort of outlined to do, which is actually sort of contrary to what our current standard now has learned us. Irina, could you speak to that briefly, maybe? maybe? 
you know what I'm referring to, right? Yeah, yeah. There is a, there is there are some recommendations from the mental health uh, uh, from the Ministry of Health of Ukraine uh, in terms of uh, combat trauma. Uh, I should say it's more related to combat trauma, and uh, um, the recommendation is to provide a debriefing for three to four hours. And um, uh, and there is a, a argument within the community, uh, and some recommend the briefing still, and the the others uh, highlighting that this is uh, actually uh, not something that you shouldn't do, uh, except you distinguish between military debriefing and like uh, debriefing as a psychological intervention. Uh, and and uh, I'm very glad to he to see uh, Rakesh Jetli, Dr. Rakesh Jetli, uh, and uh, this is another uh, another branch uh, of discussion that the military psychology and mental health of military, um, of course. Yeah. Uh, let's let's first circle back to Marit, and yes, we can invite uh, Rakesh. Good morning, Rakesh. He's in Canada. He's in Ottawa, so it's an early bird. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Great to see you. Uh, um, Marit, could you recommend, like, how do we reach organizations that still feel that it's the way that it was for a long time? And actually, how can we inform them about things probably that should not be advisable? What, what, what yeah. would be your strategy? Um, well, first of all, it's 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 very interesting topic still, debriefing in a way, because mm -hmm. um, actually, so, so for many years, we have been strongly advising against debriefing because debriefing has been shown to increase symptoms of psych mainly PTSD, but also I think depression in people who receive the debriefing. And the idea was if you talk too much, in, you go too much into detail on emotions early after trauma that has a negative impact. However, uh, the IACS has just uh, published new guidelines on, on early interventions and did a new, uh, John Bisson did a new systematic review oh, uh, showing, uh, and if, interestingly enough, so maybe also you will be surprised hearing this from me because I have all these years advocated very strongly against debriefing, but actually they found an, um, a slightly positive effect for debriefing in homogeneous groups like soldiers. Uh, where it was, or, or um, uh, first aid responders. So, uh, for instance, people in uh, in ambulance, uh, like like people first responders. So uh, that gives a little bit of a different nuance to this discussion. So the 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 advice against offering debriefing is less. Um, uh, mm pronounced that said uh, on the other hand the the evidence for offering debriefing to to civilians or to people individually um is, is still i think you should people should still remain very cautious with asking people to express a lot of emotions or details on the event also because we know from from for instance um there's this whole other branch of literature on reconciliation after a long time after a war there's all these reconciliation efforts, people going, coming in together in groups, talking about events. Also, we know that these uh, efforts of reconciliation can have negative impact on people's PTSD symptoms. So I think it's very important that we are not asking people uh, actually uh, talk too much in detail about events or about their emotions. But we don't have to be that worried about the debriefing anymore in the military context maybe based on the scientific evidence has that been published yet is that accessible could yeah. you put it in the chat or could somebody put it in the chat if you have an ability to do that and maybe, oh, we, can, I will. maybe we can invite somebody who spent years 30 plus years in canadian armed forces rakesh do you wanted to just speak to your experience yeah no I'll, um thanks very much guys it's it's this has been excellent um i mean to merit's point i mean i think even back a few years ago when Richard Bryant, you know, wrote the acute stress disorder and, and, and the book, I mean, he did mention even then with debriefing that maybe in special groups. And I think that, and I, I've spent my entire career, except for about two years, sort of against debriefing, but I think debriefing we threw out the baby with the bathwater in the sense that um, we were really concerned about sort of this, the Mitchell model and the Everly, the whole seven step, go through the details, you know, people are activated, you know, we might be taking away people's social supports. And I think 
just like terms like case management, I think debriefing just, you know, talking to people afterwards and getting them together and making sure they're okay and telling them what resources there are, that's probably okay. Going into detail with the trauma probably isn't okay. And I think with military and special groups, part of the reason why there probably is some benefit is because they're homogeneous, but also they're away from their national, their you know, their, their normal social supports quite often and their social supports aren't, especially on a deployment. Um, and, you know, I mean, I remember criticizing, you know, the Columbine massacre where these kids had these families at home, but they weren't allowed to leave school to go back to their parents until they had been debriefed to hear all the details about how their friends had been killed. So I think it's different groups. Um, the other point that, that I want to make, I think Irina beautifully put together the you know, we have this beautiful illness, post-traumatic, 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 but what happens when the trauma is ongoing? And I think that's a good point. Um, but I also think from a military perspective, worse than, worse than it's still ongoing, we still want to get the soldiers to run towards the shooting, right? And I remember the first time my kids, my kids, you know, saw a war movie when they were young, they were saying, well, that's kind of interesting, people running towards the explosion or running towards. So, so I think, you know, the, the military approach is we actually have to, all of the military interventions from Pi's principle, World War I, was never really about making sure people are okay. It's making sure people are okay enough to go back into the fight, right? So, so the military interventions have to be really to strengthen the resolve to understand that soldiers are soldiers, and especially, you know, the, these incredible sort of volunteers and people from Canada are going as well, is we actually have to sort of strengthen the courage, strengthen the resolve, and think about how psychologically we can help them to keep going. And I think that's where our operational debrief, to separate it from what Martik put it, Marit put very nicely, the operational debrief is, is a leader sitting down with his troops after a little operation, making sure everybody's okay, get some rest, get some sleep. Um, yes, this was a hard day today. I'm proud of what you guys did. And hey, tomorrow's another day. Let's keep safe. So I think this operational debrief, reflecting on what you did, reflecting on how people did, maybe taking a moment to think about the losses. So I just think that the purpose unfortunately during war isn't isn't necessary to make sure everybody's okay it isn't going to get ptsd is to is to conserve manpower and to try to you know have operational success so i think it's a fascinating discussion and i think when you look at different groups you know you know the the, the, the soldiers out there you know the psychological support they need to do is to keep soldiering and and a lot of the principles are the same the principles are sleep, rest, you know, all of those, nutrition, safety, but somewhere along the way, strengthening the resolve, I think is really important. So it is, I mean, I'm a broken record because Eric knows, you know, we're in these NATO meetings and we're talking about it and I'll often bring up the point, yeah, but we're forgetting part of the objective is to win the war, right? So I think that's the piece that we have to think about where, and, and sometimes it's their health, but other, other times it's may, maybe sacrifices because running towards bullets isn't that good for your health either, right? From a physical perspective. So, so we are exposing people to, to these challenges, so. Well, thanks for outlining these important yeah. observations and points, uh, Rakesh. Um, if I may, because he's with us and he's also a morning bird, it's Kerry Ressler. We don't have always the, the, the president of the ACNP with us, but he's with us. Kerry, are you there? I am, and I don't know that I have a lot to add. It was just such an honor to be here. Irina, our hearts and minds are with you all in Ukraine, wishing you peace and anything we can do to help. Thanks so much throughout that for all you guys are doing for the world with these great tools. I look forward to trying out the chat. I've already downloaded the app from this morning. Um, and Marie, um, your, your guidance was wonderful. So thanks for doing this. And I look forward to more meetings. Thanks, thanks for hearing your voice. I knew you were you were multitasking. We were chatting on on the chatbot chatbot here at the Zoom. But uh, thanks for being with us and your support, Kerry, and 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 saying those words. Really appreciate it. So go, going back to the audience with with some questions that that we still have for um, for Marit. Please raise your hand or raise your voice. Or um, it's an open discussion that we we have for the uh, remainder of our time. Who wants to come forward with a, just a remark or an observation or anything? Don't hesitate if you have the opportunity to share your thoughts, then 
Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. While well, um, yeah. well, making a board, um, we faced an, an interesting question concerning debriefing, actually. So uh, the situation was uh, whether we should um, like... Um, um make a point uh, make a sentence concerning like a person um like a person have to uh contact uh their relatives or um, friends and tell about what happened uh, mm -hmm. with him or uh, um it's it's like it looks like a component of the briefing or uh, ex uh like we refuse this thing and uh, like um, uh, point out that you shouldn't uh, tell anyone what happened to you. And we decided um, like to um, point out that you should uh, call your uh, relatives or friends, but um, your um, advice not to uh, to make um, um, like a long story concerning um, details of what happened with you, but briefly explain and um, like uh, wait for uh, um, acceptance, uh, commitment, um, mm -hmm. and support. So, what do you think about that? Maybe we should modify it uh, or any suggestions. Is that a question to Marit, Sophia? Um, or yes. To the group. Maybe mm -hmm. first to Marit. Yeah, first to marry and then to yeah. the group. Okay. Yeah, because it's a, it's always a difficult one, and I think it's very good if others also can respond to it because it's always a question. I think I would not. I I would either not advise people to to call other people to tell a very long story or not to talk about it, both of it. But I think you people should be able to talk about what they are worried about at that time with the people they have in their. Uh, in their surroundings so you should be able to get people into touch with their family with their friends to talk about their distress and their emotions and if that is related to the event of course I think people should talk about the event if they want but debriefing is about pressuring people to talk right it's about asking people very much details they would otherwise not have talked about so well, question, question also to, to Irina and Sophia and to you, Marit, also. This is also an information war about fake news. Can you trust the news that is being relayed to you? So if this is on Telegram, is the advice trustworthy, right? So I don't know how you appreciate that or how can, in, you can ensure that what comes to you is a reliable source or how is that incorporated or how could that be maximized? Um, Irina or Marit or, or Sophia? Well, I think this is more for, for Irina because it's about yeah, yeah. trustworthiness. You know, yeah. right, right. Irina told me a couple of cases yesterday on Facebook and about the strategy and about also things that are being posted that you you do not want to be... Well, you, you speak up maybe, maybe Irina. Could I, could, I, could I just speak briefly about the last point? Just the, the point about... Yeah, go, go ahead. And we'll, yeah, just, just, just quickly. Agree, I mean, I, yeah. I'm agreeing exactly with what Marit is saying. I think that you can talk about your feelings and talk about... You know being afraid or being worried and things like that without going mm -hmm. into the details so most mm -hmm. of us soldiers veterans we don't call home and tell them what we saw today right we, we kind of have this feeling that the trauma is somewhat toxic i don't want my family to have an image of kandahar airfield with bombings i remember when a bomb fell while i was talking to my daughter i said oh somebody must have knocked over their chair right so there so this idea of i i kind of think that these things are toxic and mm -hmm. you can lean on people and say i feel frightened or it's dangerous but the details probably aren't necessary um and i think that's kind of what we all have a concern about with the traditional debriefing is the absolute details so i think you could say it's frightening we're worried um, people are being hurt without saying you know i have this image of the person losing their head right in front of me so i just i i do have the caution against against that because you don't know what you I mean you may find it a benefit to unload but you don't know what it's doing to the person that's receiving it i think there's a there's mm -hmm. a piece of that and when we had the swiss air um when we had the swiss air crash in in nova scotia that fell into peggy's cove um we there were, that was when debriefing was in its heyday sort of you know late late 1990s and we had so much vicarious trauma in the people that were doing the debriefing that we're doing four or five a day talking to sailors fishing out body parts so i just think i just think there's probably uh, when you look at risk reward i think going into the specific details probably has more risk than you would probably want to give if, if it's not a therapist that has the boundaries and things let's circle back to marit first before we go then to the fake news uh, 
uh, topic. Marit, you want to respond to Rakesh? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's. Uh... I, I fully agree. I think it's 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 not good to 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 put pressure on people to share details. But if they want to to talk about their emotions and to share, of course, it's also very important to to show support. Support social support is the strongest predictor mm -hmm. for preventing uh, PTSD. Yeah? So if you're able to provide support uh, in a supporting environment, and and then of course you should not tell people you cannot talk about that, or you because that's not a very supportive way of 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 responding to people. So. I think you should try to stick with what people express with their needs and not impose something on people in the early phase. Um, and I think with the chatbot, that's very well possible. Um, but I'm happy to look at that part in detail that you're, you were referring to about whether or not to talk and to see how we can find a nice way of uh, framing that. You want to pick it up, Irina, this comment? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Translate. I would yeah, I would like to uh, add that uh, uh, probably th there was a comment from Professor Shalev that there is a different approach uh, towards those who are under stress and those who were exposed and now they're safe. And uh, like saying people, you, you can talk, but uh, you should not uh, go into details. Those who are under uh, stress and uh, in, in, in insecure uh, environment, it's uh, something that uh, he said, uh, it, not a good recommendation. Uh, I think that uh, it would be wise to sit all together and to find some uh, really some, uh, um, like common approach towards towards this question this is still a discussion probably 